Um, if you haven't been to any of our events before, there's also a schedule, a lineup schedule outside. Uh, this is a year-long program, or hopefully more than a year-long program. Um, but at least at this point, we're going to the end of this year for sure. Uh, and we have 20 gatherings. This is our third one. So for the most part, everything is set. Uh, you guys can, you know, kind of take up and uh, look at what your interests are. Hopefully it's everything. Um, and kind of make plans to attend on those dates. We have some really awesome speakers coming in. Um, and we got some really awesome speakers tonight. My name is Kaho Okahi Kanuha. For those of you who don't know, um, I'm from Kona. Born and raised here. Um, went to Puna Naleo Kona as a KT. And moved on to Ebunui Kaimolino. Or I was in Ebunui Kaimolino at that time. It was Kekula Kaipuni Hawaii Okona. Um, in seventh grade, I moved to Oahu. And I attended Kamehameha schools as a boarder. I graduated in 2007. Uh, I continued on to the University of Hawaii in Manoa. I got my bachelor's degree in Olano Hawaii. And I just moved back home in June of 2013. So almost sitting on two years. Um, I'm excited to be home. And one thing I told myself when I want to come home is I want to hopefully make a difference. Hopefully pokua and hopefully uh, be a part of a of something that's greater than just one person and greater than just one area, but for for Kohawaii Pai Aina and um, and be a part of a growth and a process in our community. So mahalo nui to everybody for being here and being a part of it. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody coming out, making the time to attend these events. Uh, tonight we got two awesome speakers with us. Uh, one coming all the way from Honoka'a in Hamakua, and we got another coming all the way from Orkainui Ahina. Um, and so, we're very, very lucky and fortunate, and I'm really excited to have both of them here tonight. Um, Lanakila Mangel from Honoka'a, and Anakala Kowoto Pretty from Monoka'i. Both, um, in my eyes, in our eyes, I'm sure, amazing people, um, amazing visions, amazing passion, um, and really um, inspiring, I, I think. And, and I hope that we can, we can um, enjoy and, and listen to what they have to say tonight and take that home and, and really take it to take it to heart because I know for, from my experiences listening to them uh, the ike that they have to share is, is very valuable. Um, no lai lai, mahalo, lanakila, Uncle Walter for coming. Um, if you guys are not familiar with lanakila, like I said, it's from Honoka'a. He is uh, the founder of a, a, a hui, Eolo Maui Kopono, a Hawaiian cultural uh, group and center out in Hamakua, uh, which I believe is in its kind of infant stages. So. Check it out, Eolomawi Kokono, he's on Facebook. Um, awesome program, so please go ahead and support that as well. Um, and we also have Anakala Walter from Moloka'i. He's been, he's been involved in, in this mission and this process for a long time. I don't know how many years, but longer than I've been alive. I know that um, before in the late 80s, he was running from the, at least the 70s, maybe even before that. Um, so still going, um, truly inspirational, I think. Um, you know, for, for those of us who are part of this process and the effort that we put in and, and the, um, really the effort that it takes because it's not something that's easily accessible. Uh, so to continue that for such a long time is something that I, I really respect and admire. So um, very, very lucky to have both of them tonight. If you guys could go, come up. Kia oru and Uncle Walter.
name is Joshua Lanakir Hulka'ina Ika Porno Mengwell. Um, I was born and raised in Hulka'a. Um, I am the son of Marine Louise McGraw uh, from Colorado and uh, Stephen Pokua Mengwell from Kei Pona. My ohana is the Kialakai, the Kipapa, and the uh, Kalaiva ohana, uh, many of which are from this area. I see someone from Uncle Rabbi, he gets my, my, my papa on a fashio. It's like the big net maker down on the house. My, my roots are actually here in Kona as well. Um, so it's always, a, a, I'm always um, very um, honored to, to come back here to the um, Oneahana with my father. Um, so, I'm nervous to be up here next to the altar. <laughs> but, um, um, so I guess there's a reason I was asked to be here. And, um, so just a little bit about me. Um, again, born and raised in a uh, small little sugar plantation town. Um, raised mostly by my mama. My mama, Irish Scottish lady. You see that part of me, yeah. <laughs> but um, really had the Indian desire and the understanding that her children, um, born from a Hawaiian man, would be important for them to make sure to understand the culture of their homeland. And so she was the one who got me to Pune. From when I was young, always took me to, to go learn from Pupuna. Um, and for me, a lot of my learning started down in my people. Uh, I was pretty much my second home. Uh, I learned um, my first kum was on Kia Franja, who was also from here in Kona, um, as well as the Kalamai uh, um, Anti Ku and Uncle Nale, Kahakalau. You know, that was kind of my, my beginning, my spark was all down there. Pretty much grew up running in the rivers, up and down the waterfalls, prawning, working the lohi. That was my upbringing. And then at home, I live in Akualoa. Um, Akualoa, that's the forested area up above Honokaka town. So I never lived in town, I was up in the bushes. Um, I couldn't tell you a street name to save my life, but I know the forest at the back of my hand. So, um, you know, everyone used to call me Mowgli. Because we had no neighbors, but I ran around in the bushes with my dog all the time. But, you know, so I was really blessed to have that, um, that kind of upbringing. Um, of course, as a child, you're always kind of thinking, oh, I wish I could go, you know, with my friends, you know, they all skateboarding and bicycle, but my, my place was a dirt driveway, you can't even ride the bike. <laughs> so, um, but now that I'm older, I'm very grateful I had that kind of upbringing. Um, I pretty much grew up amongst the Ohia. Um, those are my kupuna. My uh, Kupuna Bahine and uh, Kupuna Anime, uh, they passed away when I was really young. And on my mother's side, my grandparents were all uh, Kupuna. So I wasn't around Kupuna when I was young. But then, as I found out later, I was. I was amongst the Kupuna Lehua. Uh, it was a Okia grove on our property. That's where I spent a lot of my time growing up. Um, no, I, I really. Just always wondering, like, how can they ask me? So, <laughs> um, humble beginnings, I went to Honoka'a school uh, from element of kindergarten till eighth grade. And in ninth grade, Kanuoka'aina, the Hawaiian charter school, with the first Hawaiian charter school. Um, started at um, Eti Kuka'akalau and the whole charter school movement. And it actually began out of Kukurukumuhana. Kukurukumuhana were the summer camps that they used to hold down in way people and eventually branched off there was Kukuru but um, it's from those emerging summer camps is where I remember mom taking me down there. First year I was like fifth grade or something. Yeah, back then it was a whole month I stayed in the valley. It was the old school. I loved it. The old school one was like, you know work, you know me. Yeah. We had to go proud, we had to go work the lobby, everything. Once in a while we laughed. We like, after a couple of weeks, we were like, oh, someone's bringing down like a piece of paper. Okia used to keep us with the hagi dots. Like, ah. <laughs> but that was like our. So I'm blessed to say I still had that kind of bringing because now I see the summer camps. I'm lucky if it's 10 days. And they bring down the load of food and everything. It's like, I didn't spoil. <laughs> Kanoka Aina, too. When I started at Kanoka Aina, there was a one building. And then we sit outside on the break wall and do our math. So a real kind of Kuaina. And then. Ah. You know, as you see things progress. But then sometimes that's my, my thing. I guess I got a little bit of a weird mind and I look at these things and I wonder, is that progressive uh, progression? You know, when they, oh, we have the big building now, now everybody go inside. I don't know if I want to call that progression. You know, um, it was so happy when they get multi-million dollar 
a building, you know, ample lighting, you know, right, the seats are all made the exact right height, everything for ample learning. It's like, well, what happened if, you know, you know, like real life, you know, have the perfect environment, right? You can be crippled and also learn. So I don't know, I think, um, I had a weird mom, she's funny, and um, she always got me thinking quirky, so I always question everything. Um, it just, it just, as we, as we're, um, as I've grown up, I've, I've, I've had this, not a matter of questioning in the sense of challenging, but just question in order to understand deeper. Um, so, I'm kind of wondering where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, in the idea of malama aina, um, I am a product of the generation before um, that came from the generation that was not allowed. Was not allowed to speak their language, was not allowed to practice the traditions. But there were the few here and there who held little bits of it here and there, and there some of them who had to practice in hiding, and then their children got in the Renaissance. And so it was began to be taught to our Makua. But a lot of our Makua never had it when they were little, or weren't, weren't able to understand that deeper, that deeper to uh, the Kauna, and, you know, that even the idea of kauna and stuff got kind of lost. So I'm the next generation. We were the ones who were, we were lucky, we were blessed that now we have the charter school movements, for example, and things like that were from a, when I was little being taught not just, or not just the, you know, the quote, quote, and from that one book, <laughs> but actually getting to go deep into that. The idea of hohonu, the idea of actually looking deeper and not being afraid to go there. So, I was blessed to be able to be part of that generation. So, everybody, we have to mahalo all of those before with whatever bit of, of Hawaiian knowledge, ike, that they had. That was the foundation for us to be where we are today. Because if we never have that, then we would not be here today. So, I always, uh, as right here, I look amongst, I see my kupuna and my makua in this room. I mahalo for everything that you give. Um, and um, I hear it a lot sometimes from Makua like, oh, you know, I feel bad because I don't know. I always like, don't you dare feel bad because you gave us the foundation to stand upon. You're the one that gave us this platform. Um, and so it's our kuleana not to waste it, yeah, to take everything that we can and put a move on with that. Because my hope is that by the time my kiki come, then what I have now should be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we go. Common knowledge. That's my goal is we should. We got a kulia, yeah, kulia um, So, <laughs> malama um, I was introduced to the, the concept of malama aina when I was little. Uh, and for me, my gift and uh, my, my strength, I guess you could say, lies predominantly in the traditions of hula and oni. Uh, that's where I was blessed to be guided into that realm. Um, but not just and Oli. At the same time, I can still bust the emu and I can still rock the tarot patch and everything and get out and dance a beautiful for me at the same time. So, I think I was lucky to have choking different plenty kind of So, we kind of, in our, my generation was a little different in the sense of uh, we never have like the one kumu. Kind of, the charter school movement introduced us to multiple kumu at one time. So our EK is like coming from all directions. Now these people ask me, where do you learn that? I was like, uh, that one came from... Oh, I remember already. It's just like, because everybody's one of those are similar and, and close, and then you're hearing the same thing over and over, and then something's changed. And so it's kind of like, wow, you know, it's a different age now of, of Hawaiian learning. You're open to many resources of just Hawaiian culture. And we have so many different things. And, Understanding that you know, it was different as you went around the island from how we talk in Hamakua is different than how they talk in white people. Well, you know, well, I'm going to say white people. You know, this side of the valley to that side of the valley was a little bit different. And you know what? That's the beauty of it. Yeah? Um, and we're starting to find that again. Hawaii wasn't just this one wash, the same thing all the way across the islands. Yeah, it was, it was neat. But everybody had their own style. Each way was designed specific for that place. Yeah. Um, so the idea of Malama Aina, um, okay, I just can't go into it. I know most everybody knows me from the guy on the mountain, right? 
Um, I want to go there because um, that's like the big one right now. Um, but for me, why am I standing there? Because I have, I've got bombarded from all sides, from different things, from praises to complete slams and everything. And thank goodness I know I just got like whatever. <laughs> but um, at the same time, I'm also questioned by our own people as to you know get a lot of bigger problems. Why Mauna Kea? That's just an eyesore. And you know, go look into that. But uh, I think I was blessed um, with this with this day of knowledge of understanding everything in multiple layers. That there is a there is a spiritual connection to the mountain. There's the environmental connection to the mountain. There is. Wait, did I just say spiritual? Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> um, there's scientific reasons. There are scientific reasons why we don't go on that. And for me, I was able to find all this through our momentum. And the basic, and also you know, the best one is common sense. Common sense. Whatever you do on top, gravity goes down here. Um, I just want to share this one thing. Um, the Manapo of how we're taught today, this concept that's been introduced to us and how we learn our culture today is the idea of what we call makabalu. Yeah. Makabalu, eat eye. And what is the counter behind that? You look at everything from so many different angles to try and come up with, with more understanding. It's never direct, it's never just one thing. You always get multiple perspectives. So for me, I just want to address this one because this is the one that I was like, oh. But, um, you know, just recently, yeah, they, they had the big thing, University of Hawaii, we did, they found water. <gasps> There's water at the mountain. No doubt. <laughs> Who are the goddesses of the mountain? Uriahu, Linoi, Waiyao, what they all have in common? They all water. <laughs> They're the main water deities, the daughters of the high god of life. Whose main form? Kane is water. Yeah, there's water on the mountain. That's the whole point why we have to marama, why we have to take care of it. So our people already knew these things. They just understood them through a different perspective. We were very scientific. Very scientific. But the way that we approach that science is through an understanding and a relationship. So when we understand water table, water cycle, source, frost, blah, 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 all these kind of different technical terms, yeah, we know that is. It's polyamory. Oh, they call this combustion and you know, all this uh, pressure, you know, building up on the mountain and then, you know, gas release and boom. Yeah, it's couple with Adiola, the brother of Pele. It's a different way of looking at the science. But when we give it that Inoa, when we give it that name, when we give it that identity, we have that respect. There's a different perspective, but the same science. So when we look at our la'au and our plants and even our mia'ai, our foods, that's not just one, one, some food for us. That's our kohana. We can go all the way back to Kukulipo, come to the mokolelo of wakia, of wakia, of wakia, that brings us the mokolelo of the kalo. Yeah, our pilina, our connection to ha'awa, and that we are just part of this whole long lineage. But that's our pilina. Not to mention for me, I always address back to that story because in that same Ooku Ahau, as well as Hawa, Kikaro, Hawa, Kikanaka, is also then when, when Wakia returns to the heavens, Wuhan Nakia. It's in the same Ooku Ahau, it's in the same genealogy. So, in my perspective of Malama Aina, it's not just for um, you know, bringing down the electric costs. Bringing down the cost of water, the cost. It's about preserving all of our kupuna, our our ancestral, our ancestors, our relations. Yeah. In Kumulipo, that's my foundation. I always go back to. All these guys was born first from. You guys familiar with Kumulipo? What the very first living creature was? Our oxygen. 
From the Pumuli po, yeah, the evolution of all these other small creatures that were born onto the reef. Yeah, they cannot survive without that mole, you know, that, that anchor. Yeah. All, all of this cannot be without that flea in the mushi. So, our Kumuli po, and it's, just, it's, it's that tool that our Kukuna designed in understanding of our connections all the way back to things. So, to Malama Aina is to uphold our foundation in order to survive. Whether it be on Mauna Awakea, all these different battles and, that we are in are all important. They're all important. And so as we move forward, Holomua and the idea that Malama Aina is, and what I try to teach as I do my journeys, I teach all over, is for me what's really going to ground a lot of people in these things and in the practices of sustainability is not just our sustainability practice should not be driven solely by economics or solely by environmental justice but by our spiritual connection to these things. The spirit is everlasting. That's why all of our ancestors from wherever we came from on the planet all had our sacred relations to that environment. And so we understand that environment, we understand we have a special connection with all the living beings that we share um, life with. That's what's going to drive us to continue to malama them, to take care of them. They're not assets to us. They are not, uh, what they call it, commodities. They're upana. We take care of upana. So at that, mahala nyo lo. And at the question, at the interest of water. Because I know, I, you know, I, I cannot I, I, allow this guy to be 
feel that is inadequate in any way, shape, or form. If we have half the information that he has, and this new generation has, we wouldn't be in this jam that we're in today. And we are in a jam today. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. And if we don't do something, it ain't going to get any better, that's for sure. So it's really, really hard to get everybody together to do something. So I'm going to start off by just maybe letting you know what's happening on some of the different islands. So I wish you had that kind of information. We'll start with Kauai. And for Kauai, they came together last year um, because of the issue of GMOs. Thousands, thousands marching on the street. Not just once, more than once. Watching in the streets because of journals. And because they marched on the street, they started getting involved in government. They actually, some of the guys that are marching, who were leading the marches, actually ran for office. They ran for mayor. They were at the council building. When they, were, they came to the council building, they, because Monsanto and Syngenta and all those guys would bring all of their employees, hundreds and hundreds of employees, they would come early in the morning and stand in lines so with a room this size and get filled up with all of their employees. So what happened was, the guys of Kauai would come like 3 o'clock in the morning, come with their, with their beds and their tents and everything and sleep on the sidewalk. The Kauai is famous for rain. It started raining, I saw it all night and they stayed right there on the sidewalks. So Kauai is, is getting their act together. And they're doing things that the community has never done before. They're getting involved in politics. Um, talk to Hawaiians about politics. Oh, we got a dog. You know, it's like <laughs> politics. The guys who stole our land. You want me to go participate with the guys who stole our land? That doesn't make any sense. So it's really hard to try and resolve the problem because I don't know how you can resolve the problem without getting in there, participating, and trying to resolve the problem. So for me, I'm really involved in a lot of politics because on the island of Molokai, we would not be who we are in Molokai. We didn't have fish on the reef, Ihivai and Opu in the rivers. We can actually drink the river water on Molokai. We got deer all over the place, they eat in our gardens. We got pigs in the mountains, we got birds, we got goats. So if the barges stop for a couple months, you wouldn't even face us. If you're living on Oahu, you're watching. Okay. So for us in Molokai, you know, having a second economy is critical. We protect that second economy. We protect the ability to get free food. One third of all the food we eat in our, in our homes are all free. So that's what, that's what we try to protect, and that's, that's the reason I went all the way to Washington, D.C. Because our resources are disappearing. And the state of Hawaii cannot and will not protect our resources. All these guys sitting in the seat, I'm not too sure if they're going to be able to protect their resources. So I started getting involved at the federal level, and the feds now are trying to figure out how to come into state waters and protect the resources. So I know all of you know that there is, the only way the feds can come into our waters is because of the whales. So you have a whale sanctuary. So now, Somebody called me up and said, oh, you want to get on the whale sanctuary? I said, whale sanctuary? Wow, there's better things to do there to fool out with whales. Why don't we, you know. I said, no, but we're going to change the whale sanctuary into an ecosystem-based sanctuary. Yeah, what is that? I mean, yeah, okay, keep going. So in other words, a sanctuary will become a sanctuary for all of our stuff. Everything that we eat, everything that we eat. Pops, the reef, everything. So I said, shoot, I spent two years of my life on a, on a 
wise we commission, and we put in everything we could in there. And you plan. Article 12, Section 7 of the State Constitution, which guarantees our rights of access and all those kinds of things. Hawaiian this and Hawaiian that. And the main thing was that in recognizing all of our work that we have done on Moloka for the past 20 years, we're coming up with our own rules and regulations for our show lines. They, they're going to, in, in there, it calls for them to recognize the existing rules and regs of communities. They in there and say they're going to work with communities in order to protect the resources. So the state is like hopelessly behind on all this kind of stuff. Because they get choked in one of these. Keep the window. And we got two on the walk on it. I'm like, over here too, just two. So he's like, who's going to? Cannot. What are we going to save our resources? It's us. So on the walk on we. We are the ones. We teach the kids what's supposed to happen and what's supposed to happen. We fought for two years a long time among ourselves about the rules. Well, you want to tell me how to fish? Well, you feed my family. You feed my family. Go. Oh, you're not going to feed my family. Shut up. Now tell me what I can and can I do. I can go and be on my life. What are you talking? Hard to get past that. But we did. Took us years and years. A couple of scraps here and there. <laughs> And we did it. So now we're able to do that. Now, all we need now is for the state and the feds to recognize what we're trying to do. And you guys have major problems over here too, mostly with the uh, Korean guys. They don't understand everything. <coughs> balance it, no matter what fish you think out of there. You try to hold balance up. And that's dangerous. So I'm saying all of this because this is going to come and hit. Every island is going to have to decide whether or not, you know, we say, hey, you fit out. There was no, you guys lied from day one. You guys overthrew our government. There was no annexation. What are you talking about annexation? That was a lie. So everybody's beginning to you know, know that. And people coming out of the university have done so much research. Hawaiians are doing research. If our generation never even thought it was an overthrow, and now we see all these lies coming out, there's going to be major changes. Major changes. So one of the messages I took to DC was, you guys not going to join the state. This was in a room full of DC guy coming. <laughs> you're not going to join the state, and you're not going to participate and stop fighting over jurisdiction of the two miles and the three miles and this. who can get what budget and all that stuff, all our resources disappear. Okay, both of you are going to have to leave. And, 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 uh, 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 they didn't know how to respond to that. They put on a poker face. Both of you are going to have to so the more we say that, the more we're going to believe that. What's missing right now is we got the guys with the facts. And America is supposed to be based on laws. That's the pride and joy that they're based on laws. So we're not going to try and figure out how America is going to make any changes. We need to go to the international level. And that's a level where you have really good people working at that level. Coming next. All the guys I've seen in action, he's a guy that makes the most sense so far, as far as international level. As Hawaiians, we have cho choices. We can go do what Bumpy Den is doing. He has his own, I don't know how many acres he's got, hundreds of acres. And all Hawaiians are living over there. And he's like, you can come but no touch, no bar us, and this is our nation. So he's telling everybody, I got one nation. Check us out. And then you got Henry Noah. Henry Noah, all you gotta do is sign Palapala and you can be part of his nation that he's doing. And he's just reinstating previous nation that was here in the world. So he's 
He says he has about 5,000 people that signed up in his nation. So, what Keanu is doing is he's taking this to, to a level where whether the United States show up or not, it's not going to matter. And people are still kind of like, the United States is so powerful that they even control the international level. We shall see. We're never going to give up hope about making things total in Hawaii. And I call it the head. You know, what kind of governance we're going to have? Are we going to go with Bumpy or Enuma or Kiang Sai? Are going to go with Oha? I don't think I'm going to go with Oha. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys want to make us Indians, my dude. I cannot see. Dream about being an Indian. You know, I kind of buy into that. But they're serious. They spend millions and millions and millions convincing everybody that we should be Indians. Because we want the money. You know, like the Indian group. So, yeah, yeah, they go all the way. already fighting the United States for whatever they did. So, we just join that little battle to get some crumbs. So, the fuck is think about it now. That's okay. We can handle it. <laughs> so, Keanu's idea is going to be okay because none of us in this room, maybe one or two in this room, has the capacity that he has and the brain that he has to do all the things that he's doing. I mean, it's amazing how he is training everything in order to operate in this international level. That's the hit. All of us in this room, we just the feet. We are arms and we are feet. You know. That's what's missing. So, if I graduated from Kamehameha schools, and I didn't know there was an open throw, it's easy to make me an American. Easy because the brain didn't have all that EK. So a lot of my classmates, punk independence, bouncing off the walls. You know what I mean? It just doesn't sink in. So that what I'm trying to say is that if we're going to become independent, and we need to become independent, otherwise Hawaii is going down the toilet bowl. It has to come from inside us, you know, not out. But you, when I saw that day, watching this video of this guy, he was there. It wasn't something he was thinking about. How to respond and what to do. He had to react because they was reacting. They were throwing all kinds of surprises and they had to react. It comes from the now. But you could see that independence, that feeling inside. I don't care who you are. What you do, it is wrong what you do. And that allowed him to do what he did. He was like, back to the all from his power. So we need to convince ourselves that we're independent. We need to act independent. You know? So we're the feet and the arms, and until we get our act together, no matter what Keanu do, does at the top level, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Because we are against the most powerful nation in the world. They want what they have in the world. And they ain't about to give up. <coughs> so we have to want just as much as they want to want. They don't want because of power, money, and those kinds of things. We want because it's our lifeblood. It's our EQ. It's, it's our Puna. It's, it's us. We can see it crumbling right before our eyes, disappearing, getting misused, getting sold. <coughs> I used to look across the ocean and I see this island, Lanai. And now they, they don't just buy a house lot, they're starting to buy islands. So, how much longer are we going to wait before everything will start disappearing before our eyes? So, that's not the baton passing on to the next generation. 
the fast flying guys can hold on as long as we can hold on. The next generation gotta get their act together. And I tell you, you know, and this old man over here, the choke hold. The choke hold. You get what? University of Hawaii, you get University of Hilo, Community College of Maui, you get all these educational facilities. Hawaiians getting inside the picky home the child schools, all those things. And as parents, we just got to teach our kids why not to go out there and compete in the Hawaiian world. That's not why we send you to school. You're going to learn, you're going to come back, you're going to help your community, you're going to share your knowledge and make things better for where you came from. Simple kind of stuff. That's what this whole thing is all about. So I knew I was going to forget a lot of stuff, so I'd write a couple of things down and I'd check to see what <laughs> some of the stuff that I was supposed to talk about. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples of, um, I talked about the overthrow. There's a lot of other things that happen to us that we don't even know. So, um, let's start with health. Okay, so health. Kings and queens, they, they saw they saw the Hawaiians dying like flies. We went from a million Hawaiians down to what, 40,000 Hawaiians. It's worse than dying like flies. So Queen Emma, she started a hospital. And then she gave all of her lands to host that hospital so the hospital could last for four Hawaiians. And that hospital was not a profit-making hospital. It was what they call, like, today we call it social medicine. It was to help the people. So, what happened to that hospital? That hospital was supposed to be for Hawaiians, free. So, today, that hospital now is the biggest hospital system in the state of Hawaii. Nothing in the working bylaws and anything that has anything to do with says Hawaiians. We got taken out of that whole thing. All of Queen Emma's lands in Waikiki worth millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. They took all of that. That was a trust for Hawaiians. They took all of that. Created their own foundation. None of us knew. No Hawaiians were consulted. We lost an entire health system. So we didn't just lose lands and our government. We lost all of that. So it's our job to make sure that those things are correct. And nobody's going to do it except us. What's the latest thing going on right now? These guys from Florida, they went by Hawaiian Electric. So, we're going to have the people in the state of Florida owning our electric company. That electric company came from Kalau Kalo. Right? You know some of the history, right? Kalau Kalo brought Edison over, and the palace was one of the first places to have electricity. So that electric company has its origins during that time. So Kalakao drew up the papers for 50, 50 years to allow them to operate. It didn't take long that that electric company bought like 500 rifles. And the rifles was used for the Canadian Constitution. The same electric company. The 50 years is gone. It's still operating. So there's a huge question mark about the legality of our electric. So who's going to care that these guys... I'm going to use some words. We never, right now, we never heard these words before. 
And I want to keep saying these words because I know some of you have never heard these words before. And we're going to have to keep saying it so we all get used to it. It's how an electric company, because they bought all of the rifles. And the, the same rifles was used for the whole time. So not only was it for the Berlin Constitution, it became an Indian Constitution, but also it became for the whole time. That's part of the whole history of war crimes. She never talks about that. The first time I heard that, I couldn't really grasp this idea of war crimes. But because Chiano's theory is that Hawaii still exists, that we have to deoccupy Hawaii. If you look at Iraq and all those other places that's going on, all the wars that are going on, whether it's Russia or the United States occupying all these countries, and then it's also just the deoccupy. It's the same, same thing that's going on. For us, it's, it's, a, it's a new concept. So when we talk about Hawaiian electric, we can talk about war crimes. And if they were charging us stuff that ended in 1941, we can talk about pillaging. So, as we go along as Hawaiian, we're going to find ourselves warriors that understand these kinds of languages and at that high level. We just need to get used to using those things and talking about those things and talking about getting back what, we, what we've been using all these years. I just wanted to mention that level when we talk about, about sovereignty. And since I talk stick about Oha, talk stinks a little bit more. <laughs> Um, <coughs> man, I'm not going to talk to you guys. Because um, I, I caught a ride with Francis, and um, he and I was involved in 1978, I think, 1978, when Oha was created. So, you guys were driving me a car. That was the best vehicle we thought we could create some lights on them so we knew where the hell we was going. And you know, because we was there, it was really, it's really sad for us to see where this car went and where the drivers took us. It's really sad. But the car still works. So if some of you start driving, put on some big lights and we're going to know where we're supposed to go and we can go where we're supposed to go. So it's not the office that's screwed up, it's the people who are in the office. And it reflects all of us. There's too many old guys in their office that never know if it was an overthrow. So they cannot feel the independence inside them. They cannot. They're always going to look like, oh, if we can become Indians, oh, we can get plenty of money, man. Or, oh, we've got to protect all our entitlements. Because the government taking away our entitlements. And it's just, you get rid of those guys. Listen carefully who those guys are. Get, get them out. Maybe we can have a good car. We can drive it. Because we had plus ass, man, in the 70s to form that thing. It was hard. So it is, it's like, so a little hard to see a thing not being used the way it should be used. It's a, it's a bubble, it's a tool that we can use. And we should demand that we How many of you have heard of the Aha? Not the one Oha is talking about when we all come and vote to the Indians. The other Aha. The Aha local system. Nobody? system is a system of traditional governments. It works, it works from the bottom up. Not like this government. The top guys, see how they're always on the top. The top guys make the rules and they push them down to the bottom. Guys at the bottom. Whether you like it or not. You only let me in tough one. The AHA local system is a system that comes from the bottom up. Okay. So each AHA POA picks or elects a representative. So you need to know all of the Ahupua on the island. Okay. So in Molokai we have 60 plus Ahupua. We have four 
got a bunch of ahupua up and create a moku. So we have four mokus on one cover. Everybody in that moku, some mokus got five ahupua, some got 15 ahupua. It varies. And then all of the mokus get together and then we create the aha moku. So, in order to get something passed, you gotta go through the Ahupua guys first, then to your Moku, and all the Moku get together, and then you make a decision. That's what's going on in Moku. Big Island is having a hard time with that. <coughs> many, many Ahupua, <laughs> many Ahupua and long distance. Oh, I couldn't believe flying in how big this island is. Okay, 
talk long enough, so I'll talk one more sting stuff about corporations. Corporations. That's the worst ones. Yeah. It was so strong, you get on the law. It says corporations have every right as a human being. They're actually human beings according to the laws of the United States of America. Corporation. But those suckers don't die. You know what I mean? If you're a human being, you should die every hundred years. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, it's corporations. Become so big and so greedy that the gap between us guys here and the guys, the rich guys in the corporation is coming so big. I mean, you need binoculars for seeing it like this. It's like getting bigger and bigger. So that means not only they're going to get richer, but we get poorer. They're controlling our government. I go to the legislature every year, so I'm not bullshitting you. These guys control of the government. I don't know about these guys, I don't know what they have, but they're going to be no. Maui <laughs> County, they're controlling Maui County. And that's, that's bad news, really bad news. So, every time we, we fight against, we go to the legislature and we fight. We were there last week. We had 78 guys testify. 78 guys. I don't know how much we did in this room. About 15 minutes ago. Oh, 50, 40, 50, 50, 40, 50, yeah. Yeah, and 78 guys testified against the bill. They had 14 guys testified for the bill. They passed the bill. <coughs> so it's like, you see the other way. What the F is going on here? We the people, right? That's what it says in the Constitution, right? We the people. It doesn't say we the corporations. It says we the people. Not true. Not true. Maui. The council people wouldn't listen when we started fighting GMOs on Maui. They wouldn't listen. So the people went and they did a referendum. So in other words, okay, how would you guys? We gonna make the law. People. So hard. You gotta go register. Thousands and thousands of people. Then you gotta vote. So when we went to sleep that night, we lost. I went to bed and I said, oh shit, we lost. We got up in the morning, we won. We won. Super high, because we think you're losing and we're win. So everybody was super high. We won. We beat the council. Nobody can do GMOs on Maui unless they prove that it's good. The precautionary principle. Corporation Council releases a statement that they're not you know, because because they lost and Santo them sue the county. They sue everyone. And they say you sneeze, they sue you. So they sue the county. And the Corporation Council said we are not going to represent the law that was just passed. Imagine that. And this is the truth now. Corporation Council works for the people, I thought. Refuse to represent the people. So people are pissed out there. Okay? And we, as Hawaiians, we got more reason to be pissed. So if we join all these guys who are pissed, we might be able to do something <laughs> and solve this problem, right? So I'm going around going to say, oh, you tree huggers, come with us. <laughs> Hawaiians and tree huggers, get together. <laughs> you know, I mean, we all get, we all are Hawaiian. That's one thing that binds all of us. And until we get enough people, maybe we need, instead of 70 guys against 40, we might be 700 against 40. Maybe we can win. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is gather as much people together as possible. So I'm fighting for the GMO, I'm fighting for the environment, I'm fighting for Hawaiian sovereignty, all of those things. Something that links us all together. And then we can back up the hill. Keanu and his gang. That's all he does. Every day, all day, he's 
is obsessed with this thing. So that's, you know, that's really the message I wanted to give tonight is we need to come together, all of us together. We all this. This government is, democracy is coming right before our eyes. And our wives are for us in law and order for you. It's coming. You go in a room and the vast majority says whatever they say. Every chance I get, I go on Facebook, anything that goes wrong, I say, time to deoccupy. <laughs> time to deoccupy. <laughs> so when you guys go on Facebook, every time you see something wrong, time to deoccupy. It's all that everything went sinking. It's time to deoccupy. Okay, thank you.
No, I had an idea. I want to do a project with the kids. They say, oh, we can't do that. How come? Because we got this grant, and so we need to do something about, uh, we need to do something that has to do with drug prevention, and da 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 It's like, I don't need that. So we got, but no, blessings, I got real creative. Making my emo was my drug prevention program. So, you know, we learned how to flango like that. But then what also happens is you don't have community investment. When you're only going out in the grand, trying to pull money from every place else. You know, nowadays, unfortunately, you know, it's a reality for all of us. Unless, you, you, there's, unless there's a dollar value to it, we have a different way of looking at things nowadays with our Western teaching. Value is in how much you get out and the cost. Right? So, you know, if you're just going out and pulling all and grabbing money and trying to pull money from here and here and here and here, <coughs> your own people don't know what's going on. Your own community have no idea. So I've actually made it really hard for our community. I said, no, we need to do the work. We're not going to go pass the buck for someone else to give us money so it's easy ride. we got to do the work. Um, some of you guys might, might have also heard about this year, uh, we conducted Makahiki uh, Pule Ainaholo, which was just, it was an effort to re, uh, bring back um, the tradition of the Makahiki, the opening ceremony. Um, and I was, uh, I kind of conducted that um, after being inspired by a um, Native American tribe that I got to visit with many times, the Pit River Nation of Northern California. And every year, every summer, their people have their ancestral run. And they run between their two sacred mountains. And I've got to participate in that for several years. And the whole community comes out. It was started off as something that like 20 years ago, their elders said, you know, we've got to do something to unify our people. And so they had the vision to based upon one of their legends of creation um, and their sacred mountains. They got a couple of the young men together, and literally it was like four of them, and they they went and figured it out. They said, you know, first mistake, they only brought like a 12 pack of soda from that person. And they had to learn the route and everything, but in a few days, they made the journey of 125 miles. They ran from their mountain to mountain. It was like a relay style, you know, trading off hops, um, hop frog with the, with the car. And now, 20 years later, it's something that the whole tribe comes out for. And actually, some of the neighboring tribes will get involved too. And everybody from Keiki to Kupuna all come out. They have their ceremonies, they run. In two days, we run 120 some odd miles through the mountains. Not the kind of long highway, they went up in the mountains and all the way down. I was waiting for the staff one time, I had like bear doodles. I was like, whoa. <laughs> but you know, you, you're out there. And that much time to sur survey your, your aina and your land. So I brought that idea here. Um, and we did it. Everyone was like, oh, who, what was your funding source? Is it my hands? My neighbor? No, how do you guys get your food? I asked. People bring some food. There we go. Oh, how do you, know, how, how you guys pay for your gas? Uh, I gotta put gas in my car, I put gas in my car. You know, why does someone else need to be like, oh, no, how are you gonna find it? I said, I do not need anyone's money to pray. And so I started realizing that, that all these things that we're trying to do, especially if it's gonna truly be Hawaiian, it should not only happen if the funding is there. We just gotta do it. Because if we don't have to bow down to the dollar bill, you know, then we're really actually getting closer to how our component did it. We need Kahlo. How are we going to get our Kahlo? You know, how are we going to get the funding for that? <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> oh, we need a whole bunch of, uh, you know, we need to get a bunch of O'O's, we need a bunch of tools for the stuff. These work really good. <laughs> um, there was a project, that, and all this stuff that just, I, I only understood this by just seeing it. About five years ago, um, I started a, a, a project when I was working at Honaka School, and I called the project Kuli Ikali Malalalo. And Kuli Ikali Malalo is a Wadalano over Kupuna means to turn the hands downward. In other words, stop this. Put your hand down, do it. And with that, I started a, a school garden and a community garden in Honaka. And, um, you know, just kind of through little things here and there, I did, I was, we were the recipients of the Hill Island grant. You know, I got pulled into that as like a but we got some money, um, it was basically just compensated time. Um, other than that, I just 
the, when it came to the actual work, but what I saw manifest out of predominantly, mind you, first, second, and third graders is only because I was next to their playground. In that, in the first um, semester of our program, they built three terraces, two vegetable gardens, and opened up about 30 feet of community garden path. First, <laughs> second, and third graders. You get these kids out of this classroom. Oh, I mean, they love for pool weeds. It's kind of funny, they have, we had the rule because right at the playground, if Makua, or no, they call me Makua, uh, if I was not there, or if there was not a pool inside the garden, you cannot go in the garden, just wait. Uh, and if, even if someone's in there, you don't go running in the garden. So I'd be inside there, and all of a sudden you hear, <laughs> okay, 50 of them standing over there. Can we come help? Sure, you can take that side, you can go over there, the 20 of you get inside here. Oh, we had whole areas being like that. <laughs> so when I hear thousands of people marching, all this kind of stuff, it's like, cool, now if in five minutes you had a thousand hands working something, you'd have fuel. We have our own food going. We outgrow Monsanto. That's a new one. Outgrow Monsanto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's something that we realized too is that like really behind all of it, what's actually stopping us is ourselves. It is ourselves. We are stopping ourselves. Because we are bending down to the ideas like the only way we can do this is if we go through their process. And we're just like, no. Just straight up just like, no, I'm just going to do it. How did I start the community garden? I started pulling the bushes. Did I talk to anybody? No. Did I ask? Why well, it's county, that means it belongs to me anyway. And if, for 30 years, all it was next to our school was a bunch of bushes that the kids used to go hide and go smoke. And do it. For over 30 years. And if you went to Honakara school, we all knew that spot, that was a spot. We go clean over there, the first two days, trash bags worth of cigarette butts, beer cans, condoms, and he stayed with safe but. But right there, and I kid you not, this is less than 20 feet off of my, the playground where my first, second, and third graders are. And the worst thing is, everybody moved. It was like that for over 30 years. I had grandparents coming to pick up the kids, but oh yes, I remember this. <laughs> and then they realized to me at the time, I was like, then why the hell didn't we do anything about it? How much time, and this is honest for all of us, do we see it, we know it's there, but we have not done nothing about it besides the number. So this is kind of that reality check that I've slapped myself with all the time. I'm like, oh my God, how come they're gonna do that? I was like, why am I not doing it? All right, let's go do it. And just, let's just do it. And it's kind of like a new trend in Hamakua. I have a good friend of mine, like uh, um, he started his canoe, he's like getting his whole canoe, a Hamakua project going. And he just was inspired with the whole aspect. He learned about the Va'apa, plywood canoes. Okay, yeah, we cannot get, you know, we don't want a thousands and thousands of dollars like Makalai Va'a or Hokulea and all these other things for go get the big giant halls. But you know, our people never always, every time they ever go fishing, they never pull a whole double hull voyaging canoe into water. Yeah. Where's the, the practical canoes? You know, we, that's very much a part of our people too. Uh, okay, we, we cannot always get a hull. Well, you know, we figure out how to make a 12 foot, three man, perfectly oil, uh, ocean, Worthy vessel for like 300 bucks. What does it take? It takes your hands. We can do it. And that's the level of education that we are losing. Instant gratification. We are taught now in schools, and being a teacher now, I used to teach from kindergarten all the way into high school. I've taught for almost 10 years, and watching my kids grow up and realizing, wow, look at the robots that are being produced. There is no doing anymore. They are being trained. We're being we're training our kids. Every time you send your kid to school, you're sending them to this training. And it's the training of learn how to make money to go buy what you need. That's all it is, is that process. Right there. To be good little hamsters in the hamster wheel. To run their machine. You know, there's a lot of things where communities have tried to, you know, just get back to basics. 
Because the basics are people like, oh, well, you know, that's like going backwards. I said, what do you mean going backwards? Because right now, I got some kids, you know, the Kobohe kids all the time. They can probably produce food better than a lot of those college professors. I talk in my third, fourth, fifth graders. But these are the ones <coughs> who they are maybe they get ADHD, you know, they drug enough. Really, that's the reality of the world we're in. Your kid cannot sit still. They cannot sit in this box and do as we say. We're going to insert drugs into this child so that they will sit here and listen to our BS. I may never get my job back in the DOE, but I'm <laughs> I'm all right with that. Because I found, well, you know what? I just start something outside, the kids will come. But that's that hamster wheel that we're stuck in. And that's where, you know, without these kind of practices, our kids are not getting... It, it really starts with every single one of us in our own homes, in our own decisions. Because you know what, I mean, and this is my kind of reality check. We can push for governance and, and independence and da-da-da-da-da, but if you're still shopping at the store for all your food, then what are we expecting? We want all the perks from, from America, but well, well, we want to be independent. You're kind of contradicting yourself right there with your actions. Does it make any sense? And so for me, it's about <laughs> um, no. What am I saying? What am I trying to say? Uh, walk your talk. We're all trying to walk our talk. We're trying to figure out how to do that walk. Because um, it's not about and again, of course, of course, we talk this kind of get everybody like, what? You're gonna go back to your grass shack? And, uh, you know, your history, we had a lecture before you guys. So. <laughs> we had a flushing toilet before you guys. It's just for me, I think the Hawaiian teachings that we're coming from, and not even just only Hawaiian, but you know, I like to say it's, it's earth based people. That type of thinking, it really is just to higher thinking. You know, all right, you know, we, we had the combustible engine, Mike Kahi, it got us to where we are, but we realized oh, it's not that great. For our environment, it's really doing a lot down there. But you know what? The technology was here from the 70s to run a car off of water. So what's stopping it? It's not about the hold back our intelligence of, of people. It's about greed. That's the truth behind everything. It's greed driven. Um, that's what's stopping all this kind of clean energy and all this stuff from happening. So, you know, I'm, I'm as Kanaka as I am, I'm not all about it's not, it's not about going back to the grass shack. It's not about that. It's understanding that way to be able to be guided by that. So for me, I think the model, okay, the, the grass shack mentality, for me, I look at that as like, well, you know what, that house, that particular structure was done in a way that, you know what, if I left the thing and it disintegrated, it fed the land around it. Never polluted it. So how can our big 21st century supposedly intelligent minds create a way that we can build without being so detrimental to our environment? We, we can do it. We can figure it out. We have ways, you know, we have electricity. It's dirty. It's really dirty. But we have clean ways to do it. What's stopping us? One, greed. Two, science. We're not speaking up. We're not standing our ground. These guys are able to do what they do because we pay them. We're paying them. So understanding the power that we all have as individuals. Every single one of us is a child of Akuba. We are all sacred beings. And never forget how much mana each and every single one of us has. Bringing us all together with consciousness and good pono intentions. That's what's going to help to guide us and get us into the right path that we need to go on. And for me, a lot of the, the best practices is just, you know, it's not so much all this future, future, future thinking. We want to figure out a way to be clean. Well, all we got to do is look back in time a little bit to a way that it was where everything that we created wasn't killing everything around us. So, you know. For me, the answers are there. And we were fooled out of thinking that, that was not the way to be, that we have to progress in a different way. 
but you know what, we've, you know, I, I was born into it, some of you guys are part of the profession, and it's all right, you know, humans make mistakes, let's go, we'll go fix them. Yeah. Don't just keep, you know, it's like everyone's trying to keep what they got and they're still falling forward. Oh my God, stop, put it down, regroup, and we'll do this porno, we do it well, but we have to, because it's not about us, it's about the next seven generations. That's what we gotta think of. That's the, the precedence I find in indigenous thinking. Is we don't think like all these guys is like, oh we're gonna look ahead ten years. What the heck is ten years? That's nothing. Every plan has to be thought ahead at the least ten generations. That is what Haroa is. It's not just this mo'olelo of our connection to Tarot, as Haroa is Haroa, we years Ohana to Haroa. Haroa that long life, the long stem, is the idea of generation after generation after generation after generation. Every huli that we can, as it grows, it produces, it gives, and then it hana kikiki, it produces its koha. You harvest, and that same month, huli can be planted again. And every time it's going to, that's the ha roa. That is that everlasting life. So thinking in ways that we are always thinking ahead, always planning for the future. Yeah. Um, and the best way is securing all those things that are akua. When I say akua, um, understand in, in, in my understanding and teachings, the word akua is, you know, generally, we got we throw the word out, the translation of akua means God. But it's just the closest word in English that they could get to try and get the akua So as I kind of like look into this to this um, to this word I try to make it you know how how does that word for me I found like every single word in our in the language of our kupuna has more behind it. So I look at the I translate the term of ahua as that which supports life. Ahua of the spine. What supports your ahua to stand? And what gives that that ability for you to be upright? Whatever gives you, it supports your kua, that's an akua. So that is why we, our, our kupuna, we pule to the mauna. The mauna is akua. All the deities and the elements upon the mauna are akua. The trees are akua. The ocean is akua. Because all those things give us life. They all support us. The only reason we're here is because of them. And the, in, the intricate ways that our kupuna work with them, and the individuals in our genealogies, in our history, the individuals who created these awesome ways of how to interact with that environment, were so great that we um, we deify them to always hold on to their teaching, to their creation of perhaps maybe the art of fishing uh, or the lavaya. So this particular kuula. Yeah, this particular person in one time in history and time had created such an intricate way of how to interact with the ocean, to gather from it, to be able to feed your family and sustain the ocean. And you know what? His example is great to follow no matter what. So our kupuna, they deify. So now, generations later, we still know kupula. We still know these beings because their name can us to these things connect us and keep that connection to the tradition. So, in my view, every single one of us, we have the potential to be a poor. Every one of us has the potential to live our lives in a way that we are as a poor. That we are giving to life. We are giving to the foundation of life. When we talk about life, we're not only thinking about Kanaka. We're not only thinking about human life. Because really, as I see it, the whole genealogy, everything, we was the last for a reason. Because we cannot survive without all of them. All of those kupuna that came before us, the lakao, the ipa, the, the holo holona, all these things. And that's why they all came first. So therefore, king, coins, if they was born before you, they are your what? The ancestors, that's your, they're your older siblings. That's, so we always have, you know, respect to elders. Well, you know what? The enuhe, the worm, was born before us. We respect that worm. 
Anda ukiko e eluhi eli hoko kuko adua. It was the worm that was born second after Kuko Akoa, after the quarrel. The worm that then was able to tunnel into the Honua, into the earth, and make it to Hokoku, and build up the soil and bring oxygen into the soil, so that then the life of the land can come into the Apatraina. Our people were not scientists. <laughs> that they would have seen it. So, I'm always in my, my Kumulipo realm, sorry. But, uh, but just understanding that it's, it's more beautiful. Uh, for me, that's why for me that our mo'olelos, our chants and everything is, is let's just say better, but it's, it's another great way to understand our environment because it brings a different connection to it. You know, I, I, I always had this kind of a, like wondering like, what the heck? When you walk into the classroom and they teach him a water cycle and they get some poster on the wall and they're teaching the whole time a water cycle like this and get these clouds, and they get this one straight peak mountain with snow on top, and they get pine trees all over the thing, and when Sam and went river, I'm like, no wonder our kids are going to have a stick to this. They don't recognize any of that. We don't see this kind of mountain. We don't see these kind of things. How about you take them outside that classroom and show them the mountain? You see the cloud? Over pretty much any school on this island, you can see the ocean, and you can see the mountain. So it goes from there, from Kanaloa, that's why Kanaloa and Kane are brothers. Because Kanaloa, he worked with his with his brother, Kane, giver of life, Kane Hoalani. Yeah? Kane o Kala, Kane of the sun. And what did he do? He hooky up that water, changing it from Kai to Vai. Leaves up Akai, leaves the salt below from Kanaloa and brings up the Vai. Then he makes it into Au in the clouds. And the Au in all the different forms, Au Hili Hili, Au Pano Pano, all these different Au that can come over to the Honua. Hana okay? o and the water is born unto the land. The highest water that falls up in the coldest realm, therefore they're very pure, that touches the high mountain, they'll touch that water. Because yeah. that's the most purest source. That's why in the Mokulelo, Poliahu, so beautiful, no man look upon her. That's why Kanaka didn't go on the mountain. Because yeah. she was too beautiful, you couldn't see. If not, you know I go cover a mountain, she go pull the veil closed, you cannot see. You still go up there, keep up and bust you up with the hill. That Akua Uli gonna come and blizzard. And all these things that protected the source. That's why we never go up there. That's the Manahu behind the divinity and the purity of Poliyahu. Why Kanaka never go up there was because you don't go and contaminate the source of all the water. Yeah. The daughter of Kani. It's a different perspective. And from there, the water that she cascades down the mountain comes down, makes all of our kahavai, feeds all these things from the Vawakua down into the Vaukira, the Vaukua, the Vaulama, Vaunima, Kulamuka, Kulakai, Kahakai. Eventually, when you get down into the lowlands and the Pula lands, that's when you have the opportunity to use that water. If it comes from the Punavai or if it goes into the Lohi, we take a little bit. Terra farmers, we know the law of the, the Terra farmer. You don't take the whole river. You take and whatever you do with it, you run them through your patch, and you better put them back better than you found them. So if you take them over here, don't be dumping all kind of fertilizers and chemicals inside of them, because you know what, it's got to go back into the river to replenish that source. And you feed everything along the way. Yeah? Inside our lohi, in our lohi kalo, the kaloa can still be in there, the aiwo can still be in there, the birds can still be there, the fish can still be in there. We're still feeding life the whole way around. And we able to gather from there. It's just not the fierce thing. And then it It returns to the river. And eventually it makes its way down to the Muliwai. And right there where Pane and Kanaloa, they come back together. Yeah. In our chants, it's all inside that. Where the two, the Muliwai, where the salt and the fresh mix, mix, as soon as you have the most, the ew, the most abundant life. Is all right there. The limu grows, or everything grows. A big fish come from that, a bigger fish come from that. Yeah. And all of that whole system is sustained right there from Kanaloa all the way back from Kane. That's why Kane was the creator of life because of this process. He never go, ba -ding, ba -ding, ba -ding, like with a magic wand or something. We understand his whole process. Science just explained in more detail. Okay, thanks. You already knew that. 
But okay, thank you. And it will close down. That is that that's another harwa. That's another eternal cycle. And our people, we had a connection and understanding of all these things. We already have it. It's in our memorial. It's in our chants. But in our way of looking at it, we have a deeper connection to it and the respect. That's what we lose a lot of times, unfortunately, and not for everybody, but a lot of times in the science realm. It's a different perspective. When I figure it out, it's like a conquering attitude. We have discovered, we have broken it all down. We've conquered the mystery. Oh no, you never conquer. You're lucky they let you understand. But for everybody in the world to have to understand the complete science of the whole entire thing, you know what you need to know. As long as you understand your part in this flow. But that same flow is all of us. Every single one of us, we are a child of Kani. Why? Kani is water. What is 75% of your body made out of? Water. We the same thing. We only were dropped on this on the on the Aina for now. And we only live here sir, through through for a certain time. It's the, our journey back down to Kanaloa, back to the sea. And when we hala, when we pow, you better hope that you better have lived a good life, so like good flowing water, you would feed life to everything that you touched along the way. You know, the school don't like work. It's the kind of jump off on the side, they don't like work, they do nothing, they like sit there, but they become stagnant water. And what is stagnant water? It's kind of giving it dysporosis. Water that no flow, no green life. Why? Because it's like, yeah, I like, I like, I like. The Inokia syndrome. That's right. If I figure out who made that Inokia brand. Ugh. <laughs> Hawaiians care. Earthly conscious people care. And we understand, we couldn't get down to the end, but you know, I will make a good journey along the way, I will give life to everybody, and then when I return to Kanaloa, I will return in a good way. Okay, so I keep playing. But, um, so for me, Malama means understanding my place, understanding my responsibility, and that I am but one more raindrop that has to give life in my, trend, in my journey here. Every single one of us is that. Every time we come through, we come, come back in another form. You mess it up, and we come back funny kind. <laughs> it's just because of what we did the first one. Yeah. So, um, it's, uh, Mahalo Nui, do I have any questions? Or? Uh, <laughs> Does anybody have any, any questions?
But that's where we actually took it to the center of the island first and began the first pule for the run. And from there, Ronald was taken to Habakua. Um, our guests that were with us, the Pit River Nation, and this, as well, we opened with ceremony before. 5 a.m., we met at our park in Honoka'a, and um, doing the ceremony, was it as all historians wrote? No. It was as I looked around our crowd, we had choking different kind of people. Um, and do I know all the traditions and everything of Makaiki? No, but I know the understanding that the reason for the Makaiki was to remind us of this time of year, and it's the time of the thanks and the giving and calling of Bono. There we go. Am I a high chief in this procession? Am I a Kahuna Nui? No. Can someone point me to one? No. Are you doing it? No. So, the Kuleana, okay, if you know Mahalihi, that was their Kuleana, but if they're not there, it doesn't mean that it stops. Then the Kuleana falls to the Kanaka to uphold these things. So we began with our work, with our prayers. I open it for all prayers. It's not only Hawaiians here anymore. And how many of us can really claim that we follow the Hawaiian religion? Very few. Many of us, we have different perspectives and stuff. So you know what? Everyone, the idea of the Manako of the Makahiki is to, and this particular ceremony was to pray for the health of the land, for the health of people, and to welcome the, this particular season. Whatever way you like pulling to that, you welcome. We had all kinds of pulling coming up. Indian prayers, and something else, I don't know what it was. We had Hawaiian prayer, and then even one Christian prayer. Mike, you know what? All right. Here we go. That's already Hawaiian style. If you are cool, like help, bring on. Yeah. <laughs> so we began from there. And the first day we actually ran from Honoka'a. Um, by noon we reached Hilo. And we were greeted by the World Order of Kamehameha um, at Kamehameha Statue, where we then continued on all the way to. What is the name of that park? Right past Volcano Entrance. Na Makanipayo Park. So a total of 73 miles in the first day. <laughs> Next day was kind of <laughs> <laughs> Not like I want cross country run. I want a hula person whose legs is kind of heavy. <laughs> but that's the part of the ceremony. It's a sacrifice. Putting yourself outside your comfort zone. If you do it when it's all, when it's all comfortable, then you don't need to do nothing. But um, so from there, the next day was from Kilauea. From the edge of Kilauea, we ran from there all the way down Kapu, all the way up and down to Mirolihi. Um, that was just uh, amazing to be able to be greeted by the Middle East Iguanas. I was just like, ah, it was beautiful. Um, the next day, to help you know, be safe for our runners and such, you guys know that road yeah, coming up from there. <laughs> I'm not sure, it was crazy. So what we actually had worked out is the Middle East Iguana, uh, the um, uh, Paapono Middle East, which is their new canoe club for Middle East. Yeah, they like, just got official like a couple of days before. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, they took the lono by Ba and paddled it 22 miles to Kialakiku. And there's, we got a bit of a break. And we met them in Kialakiku. Actually, they came to Honopahau, um, um, come, 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 um, Honu now, in which we were able to give um, uh, protocol at Haleo Kiave. The other canoes from that, uh, Keoa. Yeah, Keoa Kanu Club. We don't know really the Kanu Club somehow. So I don't have <laughs> um, and they came into Kialakikua, which was beautiful. Um, <coughs> traditionally in Makahiki, that is where the Makahiki ceremonies used to begin. The tradition is where one comes in, and at Hikiao Heiau, where the ceremonies always began, we brought the one back in a form. And we gave our hokokupu there, and then we continued, ran all the way up, all the way down to Kailua. Okay, so if you guys heard like the honking horns and everything, and a bunch of kanakas running through, that was us. <laughs> Um, we just came down right on Oliki Drive, right on the way up, and made sure that we stopped at Akunihiki Palace to honor the palace. And then we went on to um, <coughs> Ahuena, did our protocol for there, and then we continued out all the way to Pukuhola and Kawaihai. The second day was like 50 something miles on land and 20 something miles in the ocean. And at Pukuhola, that was kind of fun, and we was running for the last couple of hours in the dark. Flashers, but was, was, was still in the pool in the whole way, it was beautiful. Next day from Pukukohola, running all the way up to Kapa'au, stopping there and honoring Kohala families, and this is the next statue, and then coming down Kohala Mountain Road through Waimea, uh, we were um, 
Honor by Punana Leo, my mea, they, they serve lunch and it was so cute. Or the cakey would come out, you know, to get a little roundabout jab over there. Or the cakey would take it from one side and they would rattle in the bottles and all. They would take the water around, they would pass them, pass them, pass them. And then all of the Mapua, the parents from the Punana Leo, had organized to take the run from there um, for the next leg uh, while we got to take lunch. Um, and we actually took it down Mud Lane to take it right to uh, Waipio. And so that's when I had to get back and say, okay, it's my body. And we ran right to white people, uh, right to the lookout. We did our pulleys for the valley, and on our way out, we probably had another good 150, 200 people in the last May coming right back into Honaka'a. We came back home. But it was a beautiful thing, and just a unification of all the people, and it cost us, you know, to kind of like everybody just giving. That was a beautiful thing. We did that. We fed literally the whole thing. Four or five hundred people might have been involved in the ceremony. We fed everybody, but everybody just, just giving. Everyone gave a little bit. Aipono was a kapu on that time. I don't know if we have kapu makahikiya, but I would make one. Aipono, good food, healthy food. Food that you would grow. Because kind of counterproductive to the prayer. You're giving thanks at makahiki to what the land provided you. But all your food came from second table. <laughs> so, that was kind of thing. We kind of contradict our pule. We got to make sure, to be honest. So everybody, oh, oh, you pule tell everybody bring from what you can grow. Right. And it's ono because you know it's ono for your body. It's not honey. So that's a big way of kind of answering the question. Any other questions? Okay, well, mahalo nui, everybody. Um, it was my intention, and um, actually the confirmation of that, um, when we got to eat, it's even on. When we got to Kiki Al Heyao, the Mokolono, the Lono priest that was there, it was funny, it was kind of funny. Like, even the Hoko Kuku, he told me, hey, get up here. I was like, huh? <laughs> you get the mold, and then all of a sudden he told me, get up here. <laughs> so he asked me to actually lay the particular lay onto the, 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 the Paku. And he, you know, mid ceremony kind of style, he's like, you know, you started something. Yeah? Like, uh huh. You got to do it again. I was like, that was my intention. <laughs> Kuleana, our kukuna did it for hundreds, maybe over a thousand years. Our turn. So, right? Continue. Now, again, just bringing consciousness to Malama this Aina. Um, doing the physicality of the run is an important thing to show. Our kino better be strong. If our kino not even strong enough to carry the prayer to our Aina, then that's where it starts. If this, if this temple is not pa'a, is not strong, it's not fed well, then how can we affect our greater environment? It starts right here, every single one of us. Um, can you give us a little bit more of a, a, a picture of what's going on on, on Bonapia? How big is that structure that they plan on putting up there? Um, so anything like that? Three times the legal limit. <laughs> on the island of Hawaii is the building cap here. I think like even commercial law, you can only go six stories or something now, or eight stories. 18 stories in this building. So three times the legal limit. How to get in there that? Um, the square, the, found, the area, the foundation that they are planning to create down is a total of about eight square acres of land up there. Um, the footing for this building is three stories down to the ground. I doubt that though, I bet it's probably more. Because we just found out recently that the Keck Observatory was seven stories. Big one is, I'm sure you're going to check the deeper. Um, and they say it's only going to be visible by what, 16% of the island. I'm just kind of old because, you know, I see it. I know when I look at my mauna from my side, that pretty much from Hawaii High all the way to Hilo, you would see them. Um, it's quite uh, immense. It would, it's actually literally going to be, it would, not gonna, it's not gonna. They would like it to be, and it would be the largest building on this island. It dwarfs every other building that we have on this island. Um, so yeah, it's like, and put that on the top of the mountain. And um, what was the, because I did get to see some of the video, uh, activities up there, what was the reaction of the, the, the international community that was present that day? I had to do like two, three interviews from France and England and everything after that. Um, the biggest, Actually, most of the backlash I kind of got was just like locals. 
and a few Americans. New York Times like slammed me, but I was like, eh. <laughs> um, but internationally, that's what I discovered. Most of the international community seemed, seemed unaware of the situation with the Native Hawaiian on this. That was actually our intent. Don't, you know, the thing is that we keep writing about like, oh, you know, they organized it. There was no organization for us. All of us were there was no organization. We all just came from all different parts. They were like, hi, you here to protect the mountain too? Cool, Some, we go. And that's really how it was. And um, so like myself, my plan was just to get to the groundbreaking because I knew it was going to have international cameras on. So I thought, no, hold my sign. That was my whole intention at first. And I, and I it was bothering me of stopping it. Um, but, um, you know, there was a lot of talk here and there. We heard some people were going to do different things, and we're like, oh, we'll see what happens. And um, so, but that's kind of the big thing I found um, in some of the competitions had, especially with international stuff. People, they were they weren't even aware of that, of the cultural impact. Um, but again, to what I found, and it was, you know, it was really neat after that, that you know, you don't hear about it and everything, was um, after that whole, the closing, we, end, we ended it, we put all their chairs away for them. It was like, thank you, but like, um, <laughs> when we were, we, we were walking out, a lot of them walked out with us. And there was one man who walked with me, um, let me just say, he is very high in the telescope realm. He actually thanked me right there. And he was like, you know, thank you for, for standing up ground and, and you know, I can really feel your connection. He said, you know, I, I love my science, but he said, I totally understand the dilemma. I and mean, for me, I love this mountain. And he said, if it was up to me, this place, this place should have been left pristine. And I was like, well, so I said, so okay, as a scientist, uh, what would your proposal be to still pursue your science and not have to desecrate this mountain? He said, all this could be put into orbit. I was like, right? <laughs> then you don't have to worry about a cloud in the sky. You don't have to worry about a pissed off native. Just <laughs> walk in all the room. You know, they say, oh, we can see the whole northern sky. Well, with these two, can move it and see the whole sky. Just send it wherever you want. But that was from actually coming from a very high influential person in the telescope community. You know, and that's, that's my struggle, too, because the big thing that we're seeing in a lot of these different newspapers and stuff, especially New York Times, they tried to make it like a whole... Um, the New York Times one was really interesting. They really tried to make it be like a battle between religion and science. I was like, dude, you're so off. Because um, I love science, but there's just more smarter ways of doing it without, you know, how, how can we be great people of, you know, trying to learn something new while we're trashing everything in the process? It's like, there's just more smarter ways and cleaner ways to do it. Um, they're just not invested in it because really what's happening on our mountain, our mountain, like I said, is driven, all that's what's happening up there is being driven by greed. It's one company trying to outrace the other company because whoever sees the first thing first gets what name of and get the money, right? So everyone, it's their Star Wars up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, that's what it is. So they're asking, they're basically, not even asking, they're using our sacred places for that. And the science already exists to see even further in a lot of things and if, through a different way. And you know, it's already been technically obsolete in the idea of it being the largest. There's already two larger telescopes being built on the planet. There's another one down in South America and another one in Europe. There's just that 40 meter one. So, you know, I just, but it's already basically making that claim of being the world's biggest and everything is already obsolete. So there's just a lot of money involved. We're talking billions of dollars. So it's all driven by money. It's not even driven by the scientists. As we found, a lot of the people that we were talking, that I was addressing at that stuff, weren't even the scientists. That was all the corporate backers. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, did they complete the secret lesson? <laughs> no, on the site, okay, no, it was the weirdest thing. I know a lot of people thought it was, it was kind of trippy for me, but for both of Uncle Danny and Papa. Because oh. I know Uncle Danny. You know, we've done a lot of stuff before, and it was really hard for me up there to see that. But um, basically, you watch the video, you saw that mighty lane never open. Those OOs never got kicked up. What we found, and the whole thing was they stopped at that, and it never happened. 
Then the next day in the newspaper was, oh, they already had done it. That what we just stopped, they were trying to put out there that we just squeezed um, the, the speeches. We blocked the speeches and everything, but it's like, oh, you guys are that dumb. Because on top of their own footage, the guy's like, oh, he's going to begin the prayers. And I noticed as soon as he said, up talk, the speaker was like, <laughs> But, um, so technically, and my observation as a person who's been involved with ceremony from when I was really young, no, it wasn't that. They said Uncle went and, and he was blessed the whole thing before. Well, one man, as we find, you know, uh, for me, I'm all about just being straight up. That the same man who, as I found now after that, because I was like, ah, I'm a daddy. In the end, a lot of my enemies like, yeah, you never know. They want to go bless Maralani, the dredging, Rokahau, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that was just a big eha for me. You know, because that's also the big battle that's going on, is they're pitting Hawaiian against Hawaiian. A lot of you guys, all these other ones, you know, they get big dollars behind them. Yeah, or their names are getting put up there big time. So it's a big thing. Um, if you guys caught yesterday, there was um, on PBS, the Kikino, you know, the, the, the student news thing. Um, there was just another one done. Um, one of the boys, uh, Hopu, I think. He's from Middle Lee. Um, he did a great uh, little interview um, and, and his sharing from his perspective as a young Hawaiian too. You know, on the fence, you know, kind of struggling with this feeling between his science and also his culture. And, uh, but on that, there was the, the footage of he interviewed Billy Kinoy. And Kinoy's claim into this is the same one we're starting to hear from other politicians is using this idea of, you know, Hawaiians, you know, they navigated by the stars too. So this is a Hawaiian science. <laughs> Try it, Gloria. Total different reason. And how are people when you use them? They never bulldoze and, you know, desecrate their whole nua in order to search the heavens. Yeah. I love the quote that, 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 that shirt, who is that? Hawaiian Foss, before you look into space, you got a balamane space. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But um, that's just a true thing. I mean, for me, it was really scary too, a lot of the TMT education stuff and science things that they actually go to all of our elementary schools now. Um, a friend of mine, she works, actually she works with Iniola and stuff, and she was telling me a lot, and she was explaining to me like, part of the thing that they're doing with our children in school, the curriculum, the astronomy curriculum they have, and how they're putting the Hawaiian component to it is through protocol. So if we need to go to another planet to live, what would be our protocol to enter into their place? <laughs> I was like, if we need to leave our home planet to get another home planet because we mess them up, we don't have any right to step foot onto any other planet. <laughs> We cannot take their space. We have no right to be in the realm of the heavens. So, but again, that's earth-based people's mind leading to those who just want to go out there. For something. But yeah, so. Hi, I have another question, but I just want to say I'm from Poland. I was in Central Europe. I don't know if any- Oh my god, I feel a pocket like change you, Poland. Oh yeah, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Since the 18th century, we were basically taken apart by three of our neighboring countries, and we didn't even exist on the map of Europe for, well, until the First World War. That's when we regained our independence, and then 1939 comes, and the Germans attack us. And then for a couple of years, we're under the German occupation, and then we're hoping, okay, Russia, they're going to come here, they're going to help us. They come, and they don't need to for so we've only been an independent country for, well, 25 years now. And it's amazing to see what's going on. Of course, all the lot of corporate bullshit is going on as well. But just the fact that even though we weren't on the map of Europe for hundred something years, we weren't allowed to speak the language. Like we didn't, you know, it was totally dispersed. And we somehow held on to it. And I just feel so privileged to be here and to listen to you. And I'm going to cry. <laughs> program I do in Poland and for the first time ever we're actually are doing the Hawaiian Cultural Festival in Warsaw in wow, June. That's where it was from. I'll see you in June. <laughs> yeah. But it's a really neat thing as I've been doing that exchange in, in Poland. Uh, to me it's linking indigenous people. 
that's my thing. At first I was first one up there, they wanted me to come and just share, but it turned into something much bigger. And really, if you look on a map, Poland almost are polar opposite. You know, you think over here, you don't go China, you think you're over here, you come in Poland. Um, <laughs> but um, now that's actually something that even me, I got really inspired at seeing this is a nation that actually really went through war. You know, something that we as Hanako, we never faced that. We didn't deal with that. They went through war and has still come back many times. And um, in the 21st century, we gained independence. It's in the 90s. So this this idea for a lot of us here is like it seems like such a far fetched thing, you know, independence from a great big thing. But it's like, hey, there's a lot of nations out there who can. And the neat thing, and I'm not to like talk all about this, but um, one thing that I, I, I the reason it really brought me back to Poland a lot is I'm watching and I'm learning. One thing I remember hearing they were saying that they call Poland the lion of Europe. Right? <laughs> but a big thing is that they've actually helped to rebuild their economy from in-house. Yeah, they never got the American uh, money and it was because we were still under Soviet occupation to the Marshalls Plan, but when Germany and some other Western, Western European countries, we never got that at all. We said we didn't want it. <laughs> right? We were forced to not want it. But what I just wanted to say is that, you know, looking at Hawaiian history that we didn't know when we started looking into it a couple months before coming here, and we really wanted to connect somehow with the Kanaka people. And, well, I have nothing against Americans. But, you know, we wanted to go here and to meet the people of this land, of this culture, this language. So it's just amazing. But yes, you didn't get to fly. That's why, like most of my friends, even though they're very well educated, well traveled people, they have no idea about what's going on in here because we never hear that. It's always Hawaii, you know, the America's best beaches. And that's kind of the image that we have of Hawaii is not, you know, the Kanaka Hawaii. Um, but in a way, it's beautiful that you never got to go through the war. Like, Warsaw was 95% destroyed after the war. Before. There was like nothing in there. So we went through that trauma. And I know that your national and, you know, psyche is as bruised as ours was. But the beautiful thing is that, as you were just saying, if you all come together and you start talking about it and you start talking internationally, when people in the world actually find out what's going on, you're going to get a whole lot of support. <laughs> it's just that unless you do it and you do it in a peaceful way, in a fun way, in a way that is, you know, you're a lot of way, people will know. And if people don't know, they can't do anything about it. So that would be my thing. <laughs> Sharing it, if I can. sharing it in our way, it was truly our way, is true aloha. You know, that's the kind of teaching that was like, you know, my makua, my kumu was really hitting me hard, and I think what helped, helped me to hold my kumu on the mountain. That was something, and understanding for me, the teachings of how sacred our mountain is, I cannot be all, eh, ah, 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 on the mountain. You know, once I'm passing through that vawa pua, you better hold yourself as your highest. And for us to be up there for so long, because traditionally our people, you don't play around up there. You get up into that realm, you do your ceremony, you get back out. Um, so for us to have to be in that space, and, and kind of in a sense, in some way having to kind of go against our own tradition, but that in order to protect that realm, we still had to hold ourselves and conduct ourselves in a good way. So we really did that a lot if you watch the videos with, with our mele, with our, with our songs, with our chants, with giving our hearts. And even getting over, having I, that was a long run, I tell you, <laughs> up and over. And after getting hit by a car, too, I can never tell you that part. That's the damn ranger would have me with his car. I was on the hood and he kept going. <clears throat> Lucky had all the brothers right there, they went slam into the truck. That's the only way he got to stop. They don't tell you that part. Uh -huh. But <laughs> then to get over there and still, you know, that is. Uh, not, uh, it's not me, it's, it's our teaching of aloha that was able to hold me in that and to try and speak, try <laughs> to compose myself in a good way and still share the heart and the, and the, um, the eha of our people without getting belligerent. Yeah. And that was for two reasons, to make sure that everyone respects uh, the view of our people as being intelligent people and as well as respecting our, like most of all,
very um, civil or domestic perspective. But if we see that we are all involved in this international solution, you know, then, then we become more powerful at resolving the issue. So then you're not alone. You, you're exactly. I do it collectively, consciously. And, and for me, the, the, um, the point has been is if we come to terms with the state of war that we're in, then the concern should be how do we end the state of war? And if we can end the state of war, then we're going to back, get back to a state of peace, and then everybody can be back to the, a natural state of being. And that's really where we want to go. So what's happening on the Mauna and in you know, other, other places all over the island, it's just a perpetuation of the occupation, which is what, supported by the money of the day, and that's really the problem. So how do we overcome that? The power of the money, which is pretty much not real money, how do we overcome Yes, we can do it culturally, becoming culturally aware, you know, of how we're connected to the land, but we must also be culturally astute about our international uh, responsibility as, you know, the, the uh, descendants of the people who went before us. You know, and I think if we get to that place, and, and like um, uh, Alana Kila said, it's collective. We're all children of a poor. We all have to participate in, uh, in the solution. The only way we can do that is becoming aware of the fact. And once we know where we're going, then we can find solutions. You know, and, and that's basically what we're doing. But we need to end this 121 year, two years? 22. 122 year state of war. So the question really is, how do we do that? If we don't end, um, solve that, then we're going to continue for decades to come to be in the same, in the same place. So I think that's a real uh, you know, question that has that, that, I think that's what that's what makes, um, not that's what makes, but that's what kind of enhances the the, um, the importance in a sense, the international importance of, of Mauna Kea. Because if you think about that day, it wasn't just about people standing up for a, a Mauna, but what that Mauna represented, and it talked about the people and the people of not just Hawaii Mukupuni, but of course Hawaii of the whole Nua, people, you know what I mean, right. for Kea. Yeah. And so, but we use that as a time, really. I mean, I'm not sure if our our movement and our um, and what we desire, which is independence and Pono, Pono really. Um, I don't know if it's ever been on a that big of a stage, yeah. that visible. Maybe I mean even Koho Olave. I think I think this is really relatable to Koho Olave because it's not just a Pono thing, it's not just a Hawaii Mokupuni thing, it's not just a Hawaii thing. But Koho Olave went to it was American news and maybe even beyond that. And here in Mauna Kea, it's way beyond America. This is international. And like, um, like she was mentioning, it's about, if people see our situation, then not everybody might agree, but there are gonna be a lot to agree. I think anybody who is a just person will look at our situation and say they deserve what they want, regardless of how it impacts you. Because this is, this is, this is us. Yeah, not just, not just blood Hawaiians, but people who, people who, um, are, are uh, subjects of the Hawaiian kingdom and people who live here today. Nobody got to leave. Corporations got to leave. Monsanto got to leave. But I mean, but people here, this is Hawaii. I mean, we are capable of having everybody here. But Mauna Kea, I think, so what, what I want to know maybe is, I mean, and we can edit the video if we have to, but, um, you know, it, it's, ha it's coming soon. You know, and that's why I wanted to talk about this at this time, get us kind of aware of what's happening and not too far ahead of time where we can forget about it and and the real life and the, the life that we're forced to live can happen and we cannot make it. But regardless of if we can stop them, if we want to stop them, we got to be there every day, every day. And um, regardless of if we can achieve that, I think we should, we, we should try for it. We should, because at the very least, we will get awareness. And that awareness might bring us support. And maybe not just for Mauna Kea, but for all types of issues. Because like you mentioned, it wasn't a rah-rah protest. It was Aloha Aina and it was Malama Aina and that's all it was. It was Aloha for our Aina. And so I think that that gives us a, a good, it's a good portrayal of, of us and what we're trying to fight for. It's not the radical Hawaiians, you know, regardless of what, how we want to look at, taking over Iolani Palace and, and, and that, that's not really some disobedience in a sense because yeah, anyway, but you know, but we're doing it with aloha. There's no ex not being exclusive of anyone. Anybody's welcome. 
Some people just don't choose to be a part of it. But it's not exclusive of anyone. It's based only on aloha, and I think that you know we can use that as an opportunity to advance our our situation, our desires, in all different kinds of ways. So, is there anything that you know, um, as far as planning, timing, anything being planned to use that at, at the very least as a platform to um, and, and really to hopefully to stop it, um, but at the very least as a platform to express our mo'olero. Do you know of anything? Um, expressing our mo'olero. I know definitely um, one thing that I'm, in, that I'm doing is, again, trying to reinstate and, and share with everybody and, and get the bigger views for people to connect to the sacredness of the mountain. Um, <clears throat> and so another gung-ho plan, we're just going for it, Based upon uh, traditional mo'olero that I have um, uncovered, um, I am actually conducting another ceremony sometime soon, but it was based on us, uh, I'm going to say the real nutshell version, but in a, in a nutshell, there was a time when Hamakua was in great drought. The Ali'i at the time did not um, do his kuleana, did not hold the rituals, and it was great drought. A new chief came, ousted the old chief, tried to do rituals, water never come. So still, so then the kahuna of Hamakua decided to take this pilikia to Poliahu herself. And so they made that, that journey up to the Mauna. It says that she came to Lake, uh, they came to Lake Waiau and then they asked Poliahu as to why did her father, why does Tane not come to Hamakua now? And she told them it was because uh, the, the rituals were not performed, the respect was not given. And they said, but there's the new chief. <clears throat> oh, this is a big one for me right now. The new chief is doing the rituals. And they said, and she told them, my father is a parental figure to all of you. So it's not just about that one chief. When that chief did not perform his, his kuleana, and the people did nothing to keep him in check, you all are at fault. I'm like, oh, that was my inspiration. Like, we gotta get on our politicians or else it, we can not under. And that's a dismal and so when they, she, she told them what you need to do is you have everyone go into, uh, into giving offerings and pule, and that chief, the new chief, has to then make the pilgrimage to the mountain and give a great offering to the Lake Wayao. And in the Mo'olelo, everyone went to pule, they, they, they um, walked the mountain, they went to Lake Wayao, and he gave an offering, and it's the interesting part, he said he gave a lay mano, which would be shark tooth necklace, but it was not shark teeth, it was black obsidian research that so I'm where you can find obsidian. <coughs> there is one place where they have found obsidian deposits. Kuluhuluhulu as an obsidian deposit. Interesting. And that was how the Mo'olelo, and from that time the waters returned. So in following with that tradition, I am, I am coming forth with a new ceremony that we'll be conducting sometime too, but soon, but we are going to be doing a pilgrimage from a point on Hamakua called Kahola Lele. And the Koholalele point is actually the beginning of the Umikoa Trail. And the Umikoa Trail goes up Mauna, or Mauka, and you can, find it, you can still find it on the old map. It goes up Mauka, and it goes directly to Lake Waiya. And so we will be doing this pilgrimage to walk up, give our, our water, our prayers for the, for the lake and the waters, and then come back down. Koholalele is also the name of the winds, um, the trade winds that come into Hamakua which then actually is the main trade that goes across the island. And is one of the big ones that brings that ko'olau, or that wet weather, into the Hamakua and the northern district. So to walk, on Koho, to walk through from Koholale Point, we're also walking through the Ahupua'a of Kaohe. Find the maps, gnarly. Kaohe is this tiny, skinny little sliver, and it goes up, and then when it gets up high, about maybe around the 4,000 foot elevation, it goes boom. And it's actually the largest ahupua'a on this entire island. It opens up huge. It takes the whole top of the mountain that's inside of it, most of um, going all the way down and up toward Mauna Loa, actually coming almost into point. Yeah, da, 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 da. there's no rituals that happen on top of the mountain. Their whole thing is you gotta be in it in order to consider it used, a used site. But even though our traditions that you know go up there. Now we have, I've actually discovered another ceremony on top of the family one, the people and all that kind of you know, other ceremony in which the people make the pilgrimage to the lake specifically for the restoration of water cycles. So is there water on the mountain? Yeah, look, all our water rituals bring us to the mountain. 
But um, and so the aspect of of, of creating greater um, uh, awareness, this is another attempt to bring to show in the Arkanaka. This is just another practice. Well, of, of, how would I say? It's a ritual. Ritual is so important because a lot of us we have the beliefs. You know, we, we know these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we've lost the ritual. The rituals were the things that kept bringing us back to it. You know, that put us outside of our comfort zone. That you know. Basically, a ritual mandates us to recognize and follow this belief. It's not just a belief that we keep inside now. If you really believe it, then we're part of it. That's how I believe our, our kupuna, we see ourselves in. The world operates like this. American system wants to operate like this. Triangle, humans on top. Everything else is here to serve us. We know it's like this. We're part of everything. So what's our kuleana? Why were we given the affordable thumbs and the, and the mindful think high and all this kind of stuff? Because we were supposed to be in, in both other religions and cultures. We're shepherds. We're supposed to shepherd the land. So what's the responsibility of a shepherd? You watch over it. You take care of it. You make sure things happen as they're supposed to happen. Right? So this is part of our kuleana. You go back to any indigenous culture from anywhere. They had their regular Ritual ceremonies and practices, and all that was linked to the seasons, to their natural um, cycles of whether it be animal migrations, water patterns, rain patterns, snow patterns. That was actually the function, as I, as in my thought, that was the kuleana of in, of the people of a place. That's why every culture is unique because it's created for that place. Hawaiians are unique because we were in Hawaii. Our culture is only the way it is because of the landscape here. If we was in another place, our culture would be different. You cannot live Hawaiian culture in California. It don't work. Why? Because the land's different. As Michael Puna taught me, you Hawaiian, you, you in Hawaii, you follow this tradition. Why? Because it was made to fit this environment. As a Hawaiian, I was told, you go California, you better listen to them. Because those guys up there, they know how their environment works. Each place, each people, everyone, all of us have our origins. And the cultures of that place was designed not just by the people, but by the environment itself. Yeah, that's why it's all so different. And then yet, so much similarity to places. Yeah? Okay, we're gonna talk about the topic. So, for me, re bringing Kanaka, bringing all people. You're gonna be here? All right, this is part of our responsibility as human beings. You're gonna live here, we gotta take care of this water. You're gonna live by that river? You better take care of that river. You better know its name, you better know what's in there, you better not disturb it. If something goes wrong, you fix up. That's part of all of our responsibility for using space in this time. You wanna breathe air? You have that, you know, pay your rent. You, you take care of land. Yeah? It's always that reciprocation. So bringing our people back into these practices. We cannot only live, if we want to claim ourselves to be Hawaiians and have a Hawaiian nation, what well, if we better act Hawaiian? Don't build our nation just so we can control our own American style. No, well, we want to bring our own kind of stores here. Or if you're just going to follow that system, then might as well just stay under there. You know, that's what, for me, I, I kind of, I don't see the bigger pictures coming up yet. So what's our goal? Once we become, if we get our independent, when we get our independent, back, what's our model? You know, are we going back to kingdom? Because you know, kingdom is not American. You know what choice is. You have your monarchs and they run the show. Yeah. Are we going back Aliti? Or are we going back even farther than that? Would it be our kupuna, our elders? What's our model? What are we going to follow? Um, <laughs> where did I go with that? Sorry. Um, my, Bringing that awareness of the mountain. So for me, bringing people to understand their kuleana to all their places. Mauna Kea is an example, one of the best examples we can give because in our beliefs, it is the people. Yeah? Um, all the energy of the universe comes down through that mauna and then comes up on the aina. That's our belief. That, that's why it's the, it's the umbilical. I always said the planet has a big out. Right in the big ocean of the Pacific, you get the Mauna Kea. It is the pico. Everything comes in there. So if it's if it's corrupt from the start, if it's diluted and polluted at its beginning, it's right down to everything. So bringing that awareness to that, 
Uh, as far as what's coming up next on the Mauna, I'm actually very suspicious. We're trying to plan a um, send some guys up there to go take a look because the road's been closed for a while. We keep hearing it's been closing a lot. And we're like, oh, what's doing? And we know my eyes on the Mauna. Um, it was proposed, they were supposed to start in the spring. They are supposed to start the construction. If there's going to be more stands, I don't know. I know I'll be there. Because I never just do it for a show. We were talk about it, I see all these kanakas and that's a, that's a thing for me, all these kanakas, they like to rock the tattoos, they like to make oh hi, Hawaiian, Hawaiian. But then when your people need you and your Aina need you, where the hell are you? That's step up. That's to a lot of our young brothers. And that's a big one for me. It's a big thing for bring our Khan back into the fold. So my thing on what can we do, just like we said at the beginning of this meeting, go bala out. For me, I had to figure it out. I can't. I went back home. I started off with Kai. What is it? Just some of our brothers. We just get together. We do some stuff. We help clean the gardens, and then we talk story in the night. And but we all conscious. We're just talking about these things. You know, if we could take, you know, all of our, you know, we all grew up with it. You know, the tailgate party time every Friday, and convert that into something, you know, functional, holy, right? If we could take that and put some use to that. You get all these brothers when you come in. I tell you, when you get people together, the other day I had my class, 10 people in my class, I just told them, come on, we're gonna make one terrace garden. 10 minutes later, we have a 20 foot terrace done. Lao Lima, I could put a tartar set, Lao Lima. Plenty yeah. hands, you can get something like that. So if all around the island, we just start pulling our brothers, you know, our, our, our friends here and there, we just start talking about this stuff, small groups, small clicks here and there. You hear the call, we all come. We come in. Just harness our own mana that we have. We all have the hands. We have the we have the ability to feed ourselves. We have the ability to make our stands. We have the ability to figure this out. It's just collective. We have to do this more often. So mahalo for this. This is a great thing. Bringing just bringing minds together to hear, and then we all go out. You know, be good in Texas. Be good in Texas. We'll go out to the next. Um, I'm a product of a lot of different viruses coming from this side. We get back to deep. But, um, so it is, so we just got to follow out, bringing people together. And a big reason for that too, for me, because you know who they send against us, is our own family. You saw all those Hawaiian police officers in their mouths. It's Kanakas, the Hawaiians. I gotta do my job, bro. I'm over that. Grow a spine. Make choices. Who else, they, if we try to make a bigger stand, who are they going to send? All of our Ohana military, they're going to be coming next. That's our sons, that's our daughters, that's our fathers, that's our mothers. That, that is our own people. They are human too. So I put that out there quite a lot too. It's like, you know, you guys know the police, you know police officers, you know National Guardsmen, those kind of people, talk to them. Don't let them forget who they are. They're human. Malau, 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 Unfortunately, Uncle Walter had to leave early. Uh, I don't think that was part of the plan, but his ride had to ha'alele, so um, he apologized for having to, to leave early. Uh, one thing is, I, some quick announcements before we leave. Um, I want to branch off of Manao. Lanikil was talking about grants. Um, not something to make a big deal, but this, this whole, all of this series, for the most part, is, is put on financially by me. Um, individual. I don't believe in grants. Part of this system is to break away from that reliance upon that structure. And a 501c3, you need, a, you need to get grants, you gotta be a 501c3, falls kind of contradictory. So for me, I believe if you need a grant to do it, then you probably not the one to do it. Um, not to say that you should, you can't use a grant. A grant can always call cool right on, but if you can't do it without it, then maybe that's not the right kuleana. So um, I know that we can. Um, and, I, and throughout this process, we've had other people asking for kokua, 
um, asking about even giving donations and things like that. Um, so one way to kind of help me continue to put these things on, instead of going after grants, instead of getting donations where uh, we don't know what's being used with that money or what's, what that money's being used for, um, we're, gonna, we're selling t-shirts. And so we just made t-shirts. Uh, if you look at it, it says, Until the very last, Aloha Aina. And it's a picture of James Kelly Luna uh, Kaulia. And this is a, a quote that was given by him on September 6th of 1897 in Hilo at a meeting um, in 1897 as the Ku'e petitions, as that drive was going around the island, or around the uh, Kohava Ipai Aina. And at a certain point, he, he gave a, a stirring speech. Be steadfast in your love for the land. Protest forever the annexation of Hawaii until the very last patriot lives. That's us. I get one, you get one more, we get, get two of us. As long as one of us is alive, we get hope. And so um, this, I and, I, and I chose this because it's not in a li'i. It's a kanaka. Yeah, a chief is a chief because of the people. That's it. No matter how good you are at war. I've never seen one Ali be 600 people. Kamehameha could take 10, 15 by himself, maybe, but. Kaikili then would break the, the armies. He never win every battle. So it's up to us. No matter what our political leaders do, even no matter what Kianu side does, he can bring us what we want on a golden platter, but if we're not Makoko, we're going to waste it. It's going to end up in the trash. End up in a worse position than we are right now. Um, Okay, this is about the t-shirt, sorry. Uh, so if you guys want to buy t-shirts, uh, $15, $15. I have some in the back, you guys can buy them tonight. Um, you can email me, Hawaii Aloha Aina, 1843. You guys get the emails on the paper. We can meet up and stuff like that. But this with Kokua in helping us to not only continue this process, but this is advertisement. This is, this is blasting in people's faces instead of Hurley and Rip Curl to the last Aloha Aina. And as long as we're here, we'll always be here. Um, so, again, that's available in the back. Um, you can find all of our videos for all of our past events on YouTube. Hawaii Aloha Aina. Find us on YouTube, find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter. Um, and our next gathering is March 27th. So, Kalamai, I got a busy month in March, so we're going to kind of take a five week break. But March 27th, we have Dr. Kianusai coming back again. Um, so, put that word out there for now. Flyers will be given out. In the beginning of March, um, I'll send it out to you guys. So if you guys, again, didn't sign in, please sign in. That way I have your email. We can stay in contact. And again, please just vala out. Vala out. If we can, if everybody that comes here can bring one more person every other time. By the time we, by the time we call 20, you know, 20 gatherings, we can times everybody by 20. Or more than that, because they can bring one person too. And by the time we call, we get 3,000 over here. Mm. Which again, is only nothing, but it's a start. Maybe Maui we get another 3,000, and Molokai you get another one, and Kauai you get some. So, but come together, it's up to us, no matter what the powers say. We are more than them. Only get one, two, three, four, you know, 10 seats. You get more of us in here, and there's more of us outside. So, um, I think that's everything. Mahalo nui, everybody. Lanakila, mahalo nui. Uh, so fortunate. Malama Polo. Um,